Uh, good afternoon, good morning. Um, welcome everybody to, um, to this uh, GCDN um, co conversation. It's one of a series of conversations that the, the Global Cultural Districts has been organised and host over the last few weeks. I should just say at the start, we are recording this, um, and it's mainly for their purposes. I don't think it's, it's going wide, but just for you to know you are being recorded. And we and most of you are already well versed in the protocol, so we'll try and mute um, when we're not speaking. I'm Donald Hislop, I'm the moderator for today. I'm Head of Regeneration and Community Partnerships for Tate Modern, for the Tate in London. I, I do a, a variety of other things. I'm also Chair of CC Skills, which is the Agency for Culture and Creative Skills in the, the UK. So welcome, um, and we hope this will be a very productive 70 minutes or whatever it is. I think it's been amazingly helpful over the last few weeks, these forums, to share experiences, to talk about emerging innovative practice, and to begin to think about the future. And today we're going to follow a, a similar format. And in a moment, I've got our three colleagues who are going to give us some insights, ask us some critical questions, then I, and maybe even give us some provocations. And after they have spoken, we'll move into a wider discussion, and I will try and get as many of you into that as possible. The whole point of this is about dialogue and discourse. So please do use the chat function. Greg will be moderating that. And there is a, a hand signal if you can work out where it is and let me know. And I'll try and um, bring you all in. And uh, Beatrice and Adrian, of course, are here. So if my uh, internet goes down, I'm sure one of those will, will step into the breach. These are very much, as I said, forums about sharing experiences of the current situation, but we're also really hoping today that we can engage in a bit of uh, critical discourse around new ways of working with communities and the challenges and opportunities we face, particularly in cultural districts. So just to kick off a very couple of brief thoughts from me, I've got lots of thoughts, some of them more relevant than others, but I think alongside some of the huge challenges we're facing as a sector and a species, I'm also interested now in the opportunities going forward to innovate and to learn from this time and of course from our past experiences. And in the last few months, I've been thinking a lot about this lately. Across the world, the impossible has become possible. Needless bureaucracy and systems have suddenly fallen away or disappeared in many facets of our life. And I think we need to ensure that we don't just slip back into those modes as we go forward. And particularly when we start to think about active and particip participatory work with our communities. I think across the world, culture organisations have also suddenly realised the local is going to be the most important relationship, certainly in the medium uh, term. Now, some of us have known that all along, but of course, but a lot of our colleagues in the sector are catching up with that. So that should be a really welcome reinstitutional focus. Um, but I think we really do have to, in all of this, assert some of our key principles of our practice uh, in this realignment. Active participation, participatory activity, co-design, co-production, value-based methodologies, helping our organisations reconnect with community talking. And the thing that has re I've really noticed in the last couple of months is the art of listening, you know, reinventing and working with the art of listening. And I think this is important, and we'll come to this later, because I'm already seeing the potential of an appropriation of community practice to fit into the more standard delivery methods of cultural institutions and practice. Um, I've heard more people in the last eight weeks talking about the hyper-local than I've ever heard in my life before. And I'm afraid most of them don't actually know what it means. It's just become a new buzzword across the sector. I think it's a bit similar to how we've been, um, we've had this flood of digital activity and content, which is really well intentioned, but I think it's often passive and just re replicating the standard delivery, delivery models of, uh, of how we, we, we give people and people consume culture. So I think with cultural districts, 
um, our communities, our urbanism, our public space, our working with business improvement districts, we've got a really strong voice um, in all of this now and we need to assert it. So I hope we'll cover some of that today and um, to explore those issues I'm delighted to welcome our three contributors. I'll introduce them and then they'll, they'll all give you uh, four or five minutes to start with. First of all we're going to have Genevieve Simon who's the Director of Music, Education and Community Engagement at Canada's National Arts Centre. She's based in Montreal but over 18 years she's built a huge number of community and institutional partnerships not only in the cities and the urban centres but in rural and remote regions of Canada and she's working closely with Indigenous communities. Then we'll have uh, Nina Simone from Santa, out of Santa Cruz in California. She's a, many of you will know her, she's a former museum director. She's also the best-selling author of The Art of Relevance and the Participatory Museum. And she's CEO and space maker of OF backslash BY backslash for all, which is a global not-for-profit that equips cultural organizations across the world to work with, of, by, and for their local communities. And thirdly, Gabriel, Gabriela Gomez Mont, who is the director and founder of Laboratoria para la Ciudad uh, from Mexico. She's an urbanist who's been working in cultural districts and with communities. So great three people. So I'll ask uh, Genevieve to kick off and we'll proceed from there. Welcome. Thank you, Donald. Um, so Montreal is my favorite city in Canada, but I actually am based in Ottawa. Um, it's a real pleasure and honor for me to have been invited to share some of the insights I've gained and research I've done on partnership work. In my role at the National Arts Centre, I've developed partnerships with grassroots organizations, communities in rural and remote regions of Canada, as well as with larger arts and education organizations and industry partners in Canada and abroad. The work my team and I have done in the Arctic has been particularly transformative, leading to a north-south partnership with multiple institutions that saw a group of Inuit artists win the Arctic Inspiration Prize, enabling them to leverage over a million dollars, devote themselves full-time to the arts, build a performing arts industry in Nunavut, and begin to decolonize performance practice, re-engage with their elders and youth, and work on their terms with urban-based performing arts centers. Our approach to partnerships is community-led and informed by local priorities. This includes championing local language, identity, and culture. We quickly learned that communities preferred a holistic approach to programming that included multiple partners engaging with a teaching artist. We no longer interacted just with schools, but with daycare programs, elder homes, recreational centers, local businesses. The so more partners who felt part of the project, the more likely it would be supported and sustained. It shifted our thinking to how we approach urban partnerships. And we found that the linkages between neighboring organizations are not nearly as strong in cities as they are in smaller communities. My experience doing this work inspired me to better understand partnering practices. Why some partnerships work better than others. Why some people and institutions are easier to partner with. Why some partnerships last while others don't. And why some partnerships lead to innovative outcomes while others eat up time and resources without demonstrating significant value. Now more than ever with COVID-19, we're called upon to partner and innovate reimagine our sectors through collective action. Partnerships are considered the collaborative paradigm of the 21st century and often touted as being the magic bullet to deal with complex social problems. In spite of this, there's little to no formal training or guidelines to offer to cultural institutions and often little leadership support for how to partner effectively. They can be more expensive than anticipated, the source of power struggles and conflict with a failure rate between 30 and 60%. But when partnerships are successful, innovation is often cited as an outcome. So here's some insights I'd like to share. Creating value should be the central justification for partnering. And the creation of value changes as the relationship between partners evolve. When partners are able to shift from creating alone 
to truly creating with others co-creation or even co-curating or what cultural institutions see more often co-producing, value is amplified and conditions are right to allow for innovation. For that to happen, the people engaged in the partnership need to have time to build social capital, establish trust, shared values and opportunities to interact and co-create so as to dissolve boundaries between organizations. We often think partnerships are dependent on the people. And yes, that's certainly true, but long-term partnerships are also key. And what I've seen is that the DNA of institutions can change over time when those amazing people have worked there to allow for partnerships to thrive in the future in spite of those people coming and going. But partners also need to be able to make, take risks, make mistakes, fail fast, and fail forward. Design thinking can be extremely helpful in setting up a partnership to mitigate risk. Its first stage deploys empathetic thinking and puts the user at the forefront in decision making, while the iteration and prototyping of ideas establish a culture of continuous learning. So often we enter partnerships with defined goals, but in this global crisis, we need to commit to learning together as emergent goals drive us to ideate and innovate. I believe this is a time when creating a partnership-ready learning culture is more important than ever. Organizations need to invest in joint partnership training programs, reciprocal secondments and internships. There's so much value to be gained. From micro to macro, here are a few final insights. Individuals gain value when they learn and build relationships through the act of co-creation, co-curation and co-production with peers outside of their immediate teams or institution. Organizations gain value through association, transferred resources, interaction and synergy as co-creation and shared decision making leads to innovative outcomes. And finally, society gets value from innovative partnerships that offer sustainable and scalable solutions, new knowledge, and resources to meet the challenges we're all facing. Thanks. Fantastic, really brilliant. Nina. With slides. With slides, unmuted, <laughs> unbelievable but true. Um, by the way, if uh, I, I'm sure everybody's savvy about this now, but if you, at the top of your screen, if you pick view options side by side, you can see all of our beautiful faces and the slides and they won't clip each other. Um, what I wanted to invite us to think about today, oh, I'll just note, as Donald mentioned, you know, I run this organization called Of By For All. We work with cultural organizations around the world um, that are all growing closer to their communities in some of the ways that Donald framed up and in many of the ways that Genevieve was just speaking about. And what I wanted to offer today is two questions that I've really been thinking about as to guide us through this time and to invite us to end up somewhere different, somewhere more inclusive, more equitable, somewhere more sustainable than where we were before. Um, and these two questions are to think about the who, who do you see as critical to the future of your community and your organization, and the what, what assets can you share together? So when we think about the who, um, one of the things I've really been reflecting on and been surprised by right now is how many organizations um, seem to be um, moving in a backsliding traditional place around the who. You know, when I think about communities, I think conceptually about the idea that within a city, there may be all different communities, these different bubbles of people who share something. And your organization or your district has some communities that it was very close to before the pandemic. And probably also has some communities you were moving towards, whether those be like the Inuit artists that Genevieve was just speaking about, whether it be young people of color, probably you had some initiatives related to reaching out to new folks in your greater community. And what I'm seeing during this crisis is a lot of organizations are retracting and retrenching, even as they know that some of their traditional audiences may not be quick to come back. And instead, what I would invite you to think about is how you could focus more on the people who you see as critical to your future, not just those who you had been moving towards with small initiatives, but how you might go much further and closer to those communities that matter to where you're going so that after the crisis, instead of our audiences and our constituencies looking like this, it might look like this. 
Uh, and I'd love to give you a quick example from the Change Network. One of our members is a contemporary art center in Panama City, Panama, called Casa Santa Ana. Uh, and like a lot of contemporary art centers before the pandemic, they had two primary constituencies international contemporary artists who traveled and connected with them through exhibitions and programs, and local contemporary art lovers, many of whom were elites. Now, before the pandemic, the folks at Casa Santa Ana knew that they had a disconnect and a problem connecting with the local community, their neighbors in the Santa Ana neighborhood, both the families there as well as local creatives and artists. Um, but they never seemed to find the time beyond school programs to really go deep. And so, you know, they had this classic format, right, where they had their traditional audiences and they had these communities of interest. But what's happened during the pandemic is, of course, their traditional communities, international contemporary artists are not traveling as much, local art lovers may not be coming out. And they really realized now is an opportunity for us to both, we're more excited and we feel more compelling desire to be focusing on our local communities. We see more need and opportunity and we're ready to focus our energy. So during the pandemic, Casa Santa Ana, this tiny contemporary art center, started two different initiatives focused on these communities of the future. Um, they started being the primary food distributor in the Santa Ana neighborhood, raising tens of thousands of dollars and distributing thousands of bags of food, along with notes in them that say, you know, we're your neighbor and we care about you, um, you know, inviting people to do creative activities related to the food um, distribution. And they've also started this project with local artists in Santa Ana, inviting them to share their art in response to coronavirus. And I believe in this way, Casa Santa Ana is using this time to move towards those communities who they saw before as critical to their future, but who they hadn't fully invested in before. So I believe they're headed towards this kind of future. And I hope that could be true for many of our organizations and our districts as well. And the one other question I want to invite you to think about today is assets we can share. You know, I think we're in a time where everybody is feeling um, deficient. Everybody is feeling our bank accounts of our organizations go down. We're feeling lack of access to our spaces, to each other. Um, but there are some organizations that are really thinking creatively about asset sharing at this time. Um, one of my favorite is this theater company in the UK in Leeds called Slung Low. They realized very quickly at the beginning of the pandemic that they had some quite humble assets they could share. Um, first, they had these vans that they used to bring technical equipment when they do a theatrical production somewhere. And they realized the vans could be repurposed to distribute supplies and food. Um, Secondly, they realized that their same skills that they use to put on a show as a grassroots innovative theater company could be used to put on a different kind of show, a relief effort. And they became the contracted nonprofit for their city in Holbeck to coordinate everything related to the coronavirus hotline, distribution of food, medical supplies, helping people find lost cats, and doing it with creative elements along the way. Um, they also realized another humble asset they had was a printer, and they invited artists and really people, anybody throughout their city to send in art, which they would then print up and put on telephone poles. And I bring this up particularly related to cultural districts, because I wonder if cultural districts should be places that are sharing assets differently during this time, that are places where we feel that creative connection, yes, through solidarity and care for each other, but also through creativity and art. You know, Alan Lane, who's the artistic director of Slung Low, has written very beautifully about the work they're doing. And one of the things he talks about is their core purpose as a theater company. And he says, our core purpose is to tell big stories and make them true in the world. And one of the stories that we tell is that our community is connected and we take care of each other. And that's why we're running a relief effort. And one of the stories we tell is that everyone is creative and that's why we're doing this poster project. And so I would invite you to think about these two questions for yourself, for your own organization and your district. 
who's critical to your future and how can you move towards them and not retract and retrench? And what assets can you creatively share so that your organization and your district is seen as creatively repurposing and deploying, doing the things that we do as artists in this time of pandemic so that we can point to a future with new communities, new assets, and new creativity. And I will leave it at that. Thank you. Brilliant, Nina. Thanks ever so much. Great. And that, you know, Genevieve talked about partnerships and there were some brilliant examples of um, that and the embedding into wider society, which we want to come back to. But I think, I know Santana, that's a great example. Gabriella, moving on to you. Hello, everybody. Very happy to be here. Uh, I usually hail from Mexico City, but the musical chair stopped in Amsterdam. So here I am. Um, one small caveat before I begin, I'm the former director of Laboratorio para la Ciudad because since I, I was a public servant, it's actually an, it's an important caveat to make. Um, so I stepped down a year ago. I was the chief creative officer for Mexico City and now I'm launching a new organization in July called Experimentalista. Um, so taking up where, where Genevieve and Nina and Donald pointed to, I actually feel that there is a very beautiful thing that is, I, I see happening um, in the arts sphere and what Nina and Genevieve were speaking about, I think points towards that too, which is that inherent and wondrous capacity to actually take constraints and make reality malleable again. So I think that the constraints that we're foreseeing right now in terms of budgets, in terms of occupancy and cultural spaces, in terms of our own assets will actually make these monolithic conversations that can sometimes happen within institutions actually spill out and hopefully not only into redefining who our public is and how we relate to that public but actually spilling out into the city in and of itself so how can actually we think about that uh, that asset and that future that belongs to us all that really brings us together is the city in and of itself it is the right to the city if you will uh, which I always loved in, uh, in both uh, David Harvey and Henri Lefebvre's definition of the right to the city is they they were they pointed towards the fact that you know the ultimate right to the city is the capacity to imagine a city and then make that city come true before, because first we make our cities and then in turn our cities make us. So first of all, what happens when we think about that common communal space as a city itself, and again like these institutions spilling out. Um, how can we think not only of creating new publics, but perhaps also instigating different types of relationships between those publics? And last but not least, I think one really important thing um, to point towards is how do we also help in these times of narrative breakdown to democratize imagination? Um, one of the exercises that we did while I was still working in the Mexico City government uh, related to the constitution of Mexico City that, by the way, has the right to the city embedded in its legal draft, which is beautiful, um, was actually work on a survey. Uh, we surveyed 31,000 people across 1,400 neighborhoods to basically figure out how we could complement that objective city that we knew existed through data, objective data. How could we also think about the subjective city, the, what, the way that mind anchors to matter, if you will, the way that the subjective life of people, both on an individual as well as a collective level. Um, so these urban imaginaries that we then embedded into the constitution that I won't get into, but the, there was interesting things because first of all, we saw that sometimes the objective city and the subjective city do match. And other times they're very far apart as we have been seeing the world over through elections, et cetera, et cetera. That subjectivity actually creates social reality. So we, how can we create better probes to actually see what is happening there? And how do we not only work as probes, but also perhaps as instigators of more generous more imaginative uh, futures. And talking about futures, one of the questions amongst many others that teased out these urban imaginaries was about how people imagined an ideal future for Mexico City. And to our huge surprise, uh, even though we were prompting for, again, like ideal futures, we got back mostly apocalyptic versions of Mexico City, Mad Max type of you know, the city running out of water and basically imploding on itself. So our, our, that prompted us to think about all sorts of other provocations. Should government care about this? Should policy care? And I actually think that that is also an interesting, important, intriguing conversation to be had in cultural districts that, that districts that blend the urban and the cultural of saying, how do we actually 
figure out, probe into, and really try to tease out why those pub that public imagination could be where our futures are being embedded and also uh, raised, if you will, and, and uh, incubated would be a better word. Um, so, so I will stop there. And basically that, that would be kind of like the follow-up question that very much stems from what uh, Donald Genevieve and, and Nina pointed towards is how do we democratize imagination and what is the place of the city in and of itself for this to happen? Thank you, Gabrielle, that's brilliant. So excellently stuck to the briefs succinct pausing you a few big questions which gives us a lot of time for the discussion that's great i just want to start by asking them something and then I will, we'll open it up for you and um for, uh, questions but also very much responding to some of these these dialogues i mean you all talked about i mean genevieve you talked a lot about partnership about taking risk and being able to fail but also the contradiction of uh the challenges organizations are facing, you know, with money, with budgets, with all of that. How do you reconcile those two things? Again, you talked, uh, Nina, a lot about how we embed into wider society, how we play, you know, how we are much more connected to the everyday. That again has often been seen as social work. Is that a, is there a role for culture? There's an institutional um, uh, barrier to that in some ways. And of course, Gabrielle, you're talking about the thing that a lot of us believe in, which is culture in democracy, culture as a human right, something that people are entitled to um, uh, wherever they live against uh, a bigger a global geopolitics. So I think I've learned a lot from uh, in the cultural world over the last few years from the activisms of people in the global, uh, in the environment and climate change movement, which seem to have been very, very successful. Do you think we are moving into or reappraising our role as activists? And activism is going to be a big part in, in our institutions and in using uh, our cultural districts as these sort of urban laboratories and thought pieces that you're, that you're talking about. Any thoughts? Or is that you know, something completely different? Nina, Gabriella? Um, yeah, sure. I'll I'll jump in. I I absolutely think so. I I'm, I think um, we're seeing that both in individual artists as well as institutions that are truly trying to rethink their place in society, because I feel that many roles that we could have taken on both on a personal as well as collective level really need to be rethought in context to everything that is happening. So how does one keep one's relevance? Um, so I do believe that we will see a return to social practices and community practices and really thinking about what this creative ethos could mean for society when it encounters communities, when it encounters neighborhoods, when it encounters streets, but also when it encounters other disciplines. That so was also one of our fascinations at the lab. You know, what, what happens with that essential creative ethos actually meets science and not necessarily bringing science into the art world, but truly creating transdisciplinary practices uh, which is not one plus one equals two, but rather like a new mix that comes out of, of, of this potential. At the same time, I also think, and, and this um, going back to democratizing imagination, um, I believe that in a certain sense, a lot of what will be asked of our society right now is to be able to reconfigure and reimagine anew um, so that we don't bounce back, as you well mentioned, Donald, at the beginning, and, and try to speed our way back into the world that we just left behind for, for better or for worse. Um, and I do think that these two narratives are going to be fighting of, of one, what do we, like, now that the world has come undone and there's more space between the pieces, can we remake it? Is going to be one thing that many of us hopefully are going to be pushing for. But I think just like the, the uh, inertia towards... Uh, post PTSD syndrome that we're all going to have after this whole or ordeal, um, we, we see the light on the other end, is also going to be like a, a very inherent need perhaps to get back to the world that we knew and where we feel comfortable. But I also think that artistic practices per se have always been one of these gymnasiums for the imagination, if you will. And one of the things that we're going to be needing right now is a very substantial uh, very flexible imagination of the things we and the societies we could become. So how can art 
not only in encounter with social practices and other disciplines, but art for art's sake as well, also create those types of spaces of exploration, of imagination, of experimentation that could also hold a certain DNA of societies pushing forward towards other grander stories. But that's still a challenge because we codify imagination. We're creative organizations, but it does have to work mm. in a certain paradigm. So I, I hope we can take it. Nina? Well, and yeah, I, I uh, well, first of all, Gabriella, I just love the frame around democratizing imagination. And I think that this question right now is what role are our institutions going to have in accelerating and supporting that democratization or in resisting and confining it. And, and you know, I think about um, when, um, when in, in Ferguson, in St. Louis, you know, when there was um, incredible um, outcry and protesting and rallying um, against police brutality and violence, um, you know, I remember talking to a preacher involved with it who said, we marched to where the library and the museum were and those places closed their doors to us. And this idea that these institutions had been selling a promise of being community institutions, of being places where we come together, where we share, where we make ourselves whole. But in a time of crisis, they were closed because of a feeling of threat to the institution or institutional safety. And I think similarly right now, when we think about what role are cultural institutions going to play? Um, and you know, you brought up the classic question, right? About is this social work, is it instrumentalization of art? And I guess I feel like in the last several years, and I imagine many of us on this call, we've been moving quite aggressively to at least claiming and promising that we are for communities, that we are for everyone, not just for the whitest, wealthiest, most educated people. Um, and I think that now is a time where we have to decide, are we going to make good on that promise, both in terms of where we direct our constrained resources, who are we directing them towards at this time, but also, are we gonna make good on the promise that we bring together communities, that we celebrate creativity Activity in all of its forms. And I would love to see institutions be accelerants of the kind of democratization of imagination that Gabrielle is talking about. But I think for many of us that requires unlearning a different way of confining, constraining, and validating um, whose creativity matters. And so I, I think this is actually quite a of test, not just of our principles, but also of what we've been promising and frankly, what we've been selling to funders for quite a long time now. And I think that for so, to some extent, we've gotten away with it um, sector wide, and we have been able to raise money against this story of being town halls and gathering places. And I think now we are really having a rubber hits the road moment of saying, is that credible? Are we going to lean into it? And um, what is the beautiful opportunity for us to go all in on something that we have been talking about, raising money against, and at least making beautiful presentations about for a long time. Um, and that's why the institutions that, uh, I, I guess the hopeful side of me feels like, wow, there are these institutions that are really leaning into it. But I also notice that those institutions tend to be ones who are smaller, who have been doing this kind of work for longer. Um, and I'm noting that some of the biggest institutions that have raised the most number of zeros in terms of dollars against um, language of community, language of democratization um, are shut and focused on their traditional audiences right now. So I think we have to choose to live into the promise we've made to ourselves, our communities and our funders. Brilliant. I, I mean, just to echo that, I've just been on a, a board meeting of a small arts organisation in Scotland I'm with an island community, and they have been doing exactly that. The people on the edge and the small communities have, uh, have been working in many of these methods that we're talking about uh, long past, and we can learn a bit more from the edge and the periphery now, I think, going forward. Uh, Michelle had her hand up, but I just wanted to and Genevieve, you've done work with rural communities. Is there anything you wanted to yes, add? I, well, I just wanted to um, talk about the, the, the idea of what is an essential service in this time. And, uh, you know, art and art makers, our artists, they, they are essential. Um, and so I think that it is upon us also to 
as, and I work for a very large organization, but you know, we're, we're thinking externally outward and also the advocacy piece of why art actually matters and really going to our audiences to ask for their own personal stories of how art has, has helped them get through this. Um, but I'm very concerned about, you know, the uh, educational institutions um, that are actually not validating art as essential learning for, for classes in times of social distancing. So we've seen arts and sports, um, you know, further, further um, distance from core curricula and um, that that is that is very concerning and uh, you know reduction of field trips reduction of budgets to support arts learning um, so that that's another priority that I think we can't we can't ignore so great I really like this you know this is like a rallying call we're talking about you know the power of what we do and the, the potential going forward so great and I think I want we want let's try and keep that vibe so if um, I want to open it up now, if, is there any particular questions you want to ask? Someone make a contribution, respond to some of these questions. I'm sure you've got plenty to say. I can't see you all. I have to flick receiving the screen. Maybe I should pick on Adrian or Beatrice first to, to come in because they've been in all of these uh, seminars and uh, maybe you can put that into a bit of that context and then we'll see if the hands come up. Uh, I'm happy to. Oh, Adrian, do you want to go? Oh, both of you. I, go. I was unmuting myself, but go. <laughs> go on, you're, you're dying to go. I, I can come in after. <laughs> no, this was, this was really not so much directed at the three great speakers as, as to the, the other GCDN members, which is, which is to some extent um, uh, the agenda and the current situation and the interpretation of the current situation and the responsibilities of cultural institutions that Nina and the other speakers have articulated absolutely puts cultural districts sort of on their metal, which is what is their underlying essential role of the entity that is the cultural district, as opposed to the institutions, the cultural institutions within it? And how do they dispatch those, those wider social duties? So I'm just really interested to know you know, in a sense, it's a sort of gauntlet laid down to us to articulate the, the, the value proposition and illustrate it very concretely, which is what, our, what, what the social role is in this context. And I'm, just, I'm just interested in how readily to mind, as it were, the answers of, of members are about that role. So it's really a, a sort of um, a very specific question aimed at, aimed at ourselves collectively. Good. I would just say, have you, I don't know if you've seen um, Beatrice just before the, just seen the hand, the New Zealand Prime Minister this morning talking about GDP now going to be assess, assessed around value, quality of life, mental well-being, all of those things. When we start to get the political narrative into those qualitative terms, that's a seismic change for me, I think. And okay, it's New Zealand and they're incredibly progressive, but it seems to be a start. Future. Yeah, they're also going for the four-day week, so <laughs> I, think I can sign up for that. Um, so I think uh, there have been, through these calls, lots of examples from our cultural district members of um, districts that have repurposed um, themselves and added value, you know, for example, spaces that are um, becoming uh, blood banks, um, allowing food trucks to be sent, uh, working with emergency services, partnering with health facilities, you know, some really responsive and imaginative ways of working, both with um, the cultural sector and also all other kinds of communities within the city. Um, but this is challenging and it's particularly challenging when at the same time you're having to manage a huge number of staff, buildings that um, are being shut down, um, public spaces that are having to be policed in new ways, um, which, you know, I, I say that uh, without judgment, but um, spaces where, you know, because of the economic devastation, there are more numbers um, 
of people using them in different ways. Um, and I think that's a really heady mix for people that are um, based within institutions um, who may very well want to do all of the things that our speakers have spoken about. So I guess I'm asking how, how, do, how do we find ways to operate differently, um, to pivot as everyone is asking us to, but at the same time deal with the realities of running these buildings, these large number of staff, um, and um, you know, maintain health and safety realities. I think um, you know, there's a. I think absolutely that's one of the dilemmas. I see Carabs asked a couple of questions. Gabrielle, one of them is about is bringing citizens into governance and into the formal side of it. One of the keys to that, not only, but do you think? What do you think? We need to do more of that. I absolutely think so. I have my biases because that is actually exactly what the lab did was uh, make a bridge between government, which is usually happens very much behind closed doors, um, and really push the idea within the bureaucracy that perhaps the most underutilized resource that a city has is citizen talent. So if you cannot articulate into that, you're losing on a whole series of, of possibilities. Um, and also, hence pushing for the fact that perhaps government as we know it now as you know this huge slightly unwieldy institution that is made to receive complaints and keep the peace to mo peace mostly worked very well uh, under a more modernistic idea of the city where you know cities were made to be efficient and productive and hygienic and all of these things that don't get me wrong are important but do we optimize for that and i think the answer of the last several decades is no um, cities, when seen more as cultural artifacts, it's, we're all familiar with with that that space and those that that language and and those type of metaphors. I think will actually give uh, much more interesting results. And yes, talk about efficiency and productivity and all of those other things. But again, like not not necessarily optimizing for that. Um, and I do think that leading back into the point of democratizing imagination plus bringing people's voices in. Um, I, I do believe that every time that we push for participation, it should be, as was mentioned before, with the aim of creating public value. And for public value to be created, we actually need to prep the social space as well. It's not that you open up the doors and everything happens. We know about none in my backyard and we know about you know, the tyranny of the majority and all of these more darker sides of participation. So, what does it actually mean to start prepping that social space so that when we do let different voices in, it is in every time more powerful, imaginative, and useful ways for a society uh, writ large. And again, I do think that cultural institutions have a lot to say in terms of um, that conversation. You know, one artist I've been um, coming back to a lot right now is Candy Chang and some of the work she did in New Orleans um, after Hurricane Katrina. Um, and this idea of inviting people, you know, on the sides of abandoned buildings to imagine, imagine what, how, how they, they wanted, wanted their, their city, city to transform. transform. And I guess I think about um, cultural districts and particularly this opportunity to say, what is the, um, what are the operating values of this space. And I think about, you know, um, there are some incredible creative operating values that could be in place around how the physical space is going to be made safe and creative, but there also are some really deliberate choices that you can make. You know, I think about, you know, what's happened this week um, in both Minneapolis um, and in Central Park, you know, and you think about in Central Park, this idea of police being weaponized um, because of a white woman's discomfort um, and feeling and perception causing a situation of incredible unsafety for a black man. You know, what would it look like for people who run a district to decide, here's how we're going to um, engage and support and enforce during this time. And, you know, I'm seeing a lot of small businesses make decisions and put up signs and saying, we do not call the police. Um, you know, here's how we engage around community issues. Here's how we're engaging at this moment and safety. And so I think that there's an opportunity for cultural districts to 
distinguish themselves by saying, we have a different set of operating principles in this space, and we're doing it in a way that privileges people who may be feeling furthest from power, um, least safe, um, and most constrained and potentially um, caused violence by some of the ways that we are operating our general, you know, our broader countries right now. I, I could not agree more, Nina. I, I have the feeling that thinking about these worlds within worlds, and, and I think a cultural district could be that, is a great way to push forward, especially because it would seem, obviously there, there's huge, wonderful exceptions, but many of the cultural districts I, I visited sometimes, that density of institutions, if you will, does not necessarily mean a density of interactions. It rather means that you know these buildings sit by, side by side, but then what is actually happening in between? And how does a mythos get woven into a space that spills out of every one of them and intermingles, if you will, to create um, a heterotopia, if you will, if not a utopia. So, so I could not uh, agree more. I but think I think, it's but I mean, maybe there are people here from, from sorry, I was just going to say there are people from business cultural districts here as well. And I know, I mean, Candy Chang has been done and I, I know that place. And it is that place where the collision between business, tourists, communities, all happens. So I, there are some good examples. Shan, they've been doing some interesting stuff in London. And I do think, again, it's the arena because this social distancing is a misnomer, you know. It's physical distancing we have to do. We don't want social distance, don't we? And it would seem to me that the public spaces between the buildings, people said, are going to be optimum in, in doing that. Sorry, Genevieve, did you want to say something? And then anyone from the business or cultural districts give us a bit of their... Experience. Sure. I, 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 um, I don't want to take it too much time, but it, it just, um, I'm, I'm looking at the, the chat uh, feed as well. And I think, it, you know, back to what we've been talking about, um, this invitation to co-produce, co-create, um, reimagine together, um, democratization of imagination. To me, it's an opportunity to, to really engage in districts with communities to curate, you know, a festival, to have a, a theme that is, is galvanizing and speaks to that community and to pool resources and to provide opportunities for young people with nothing to do on their hands um, with, with an opportunity to funnel energy in a, in a creative way and to um, give back to, to, to the community, but to, to, for them to see themselves taking an essential role in the actual curation and vision of, of that. I think that's, that's a, a powerful piece. I've seen it done um, very effectively around the world. Shan, do you want to say anything? Hi, uh, yeah, thanks so much. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, this is really helpful discussion actually and really timely for us uh, we've actually got a workshop on Monday uh, which is just starting to think about this um, so it, you know we're really I guess at the beginning of the journey for culture Mall, I'm sure um, somebody will will be aware we're based in the city of London within the heart um, of London obviously um, so there we have the financial and professional services sector alongside cultural organizations like the Barbican Museum of London London Symphony Orchestra so I guess this is a really live challenge for us um, as well. You know, a lot of those organisations are facing, you know, huge challenges at the moment, as you all um, point out, uh, in terms of just how to stay afloat themselves. You know, what is this kind of trajectory going to look like? What are the phases um, of kind of, you know, potential activity? And who is that local community? Um, so this is really helpful to us to start to think that through. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think for us, um, it is about looking at, uh, it's actually, it's not a very residential area, the city of London. Um, you know, there are, I can't remember the, the exact figure, but a few hundred um, residents on our immediate um, mm. doorstep. So for us, it's thinking about that kind of, um, that slightly strange role where we don't have an immediate residential population within our um, geography, but we're actually on the cusp of an awful lot of, um, you know, very mixed communities within London. 
So Tower Hamlets, for instance, is on our doorstep, which has some, you know, really deprived and vulnerable communities right now. Whereas uh, within the city of London, obviously we have some, some very wealthy um, residents as well. And then the, the worker community, again, is something that we're, we're really conscious of. Um, you know, we have the highest concentration of workers who come into any patch of, of England. Um, at the moment, obviously, all of those are staying away. So what's our role in, um, in the kind of the local uh, benefit? What's the role that we could be playing? Um, what's the role of the city as a kind of a business and cultural cluster right now? Um, because obviously, if people continue to work in a kind of a remote way, what's the call on them to come into Culture Mile, to come into the city of London? How do we make that experience for the worker community um, kind of worth their while in terms of coming into the area? Um, and then I think we're starting to think through how we can help to kickstart the economy. So again, you know, a lot of the work we've been doing in the lead up to lockdown um, was about saying we think there's both obviously social value and economic value that we can harness through creativity um, and we need to be much more overt about that and think through how we put our money where our mouth is and obviously this is the ideal opportunity for us to uh, to show that, that that is a reality and as you know as you've all quite rightly said Nina in particular how that isn't just rhetoric um, so you know, think... we're really conscious of that role. Good question, isn't it, about the quantum mass and how, I mean, the empowerment of cultural districts, but getting the people uh, back into them. And although I know you've done something which lots of people have done, but it's part of this almost return to the linear, if that's the right word. You're doing a community radio program this week, and you know, not everyone we know, Panama City is a good example. People don't have access to the internet and Facebook and all of that. Um, so some of those more traditional methods when people aren't physically present around radio and listening and people keep talking about listening it's so important I think um, they are some of the bridges at the moment. Yeah definitely yeah and um, we've been doing some um, play packs as well so again yeah. how can you kind of link the digital with the with the non-digital. Okay great anyone else got a question thoughts? Come on they've given you these uh, provocations these questions Michelle, great. I just wanted to uh, share, you know, we're thinking about community a little differently. Um, our community that we're trying to reach out to is more about the um, cultural community in Chicago and how our space might be a resource for other cultural organizations that can no longer um, have rehearsals in their spaces because they're too small. Uh, can't present their work because, you know, the kibosh is on um, theater spaces now and enclosed. And so we have a number of outdoor spaces and large open spaces that traditionally have been used for, you know, trade shows or events. And so, you know, we've extended the space to other cultural organizations, um, some that are kind of small community-based organizations and said, you know, we have the space, it's not being used, can this be a resource for you to, you know, present your work to audiences that can honor the social distancing um, or use it for a rehearsal space? And so we're just trying to think creatively about the um, peer as a platform now to present the works for others who aren't able to do so anymore in their spaces because of you know, limitations on the number of people that can be um, inside of a space or concerns about just honoring social distancing for performers and audience members. And so while we're not um, there yet and thinking about like, oh, serving our immediate community of um, audiences, um, but really about it being, uh, how do we make it a resource for our community um, and the yeah. cultural community of the city? And what a powerful prompt. Sorry, go ahead, Don. <laughs> no, 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 go, go. Oh, I, I, Michelle, I really appreciate that. And I, I think it's such a powerful promise um, and potential story to be able to say that Navy Pier is part of how artists are able to not just get back to work, but to share and connect with others. And I guess what I would get curious about also is, 
are there ways that you can reach out to arts organizations that might um, be so small or be really culturally um, situated in certain neighborhoods such that they might not be kind of in that top 50 list in Chicago? Um, because I think you can also really curate whether Navy Pier is seen as, oh, it's the place where all the culturally specific theater companies got to present um, or all of the different samba groups. And, you know, I think there's a lot around music and dance as well that is happening in very small ways as well as in very big ways. And I don't necessarily have an opinion one way or the other, but I think it's just a very different story if it's like, oh, the symphony orchestra performing at Navy Pier versus, oh, um, it's bachata and samba happening at Navy Pier. And of course, both can happen. But mm -hmm. I think that, you know, there's been a lot also in the chat around like, how do we um, reach out to new communities? And I think that this is an opportunity and a moment to get really deliberate about saying the people we most want to be supporting and empowering and engaging are X, and therefore we're gonna spend a lot of our energy finding and creating in partnership with them. And sure, if the symphony wants to come too, um, within the construct of what we built with the Samba group, great, but we're gonna start with the Samba group, not with the symphony. And I guess I've just demonstrated my bias there <laughs> in saying that, but- No, um, that actually, that's yeah. been kind of our intent, that it's not so much about the larger cultural institutions, but um, the smaller under-resourced ones that are really um, being hit hard um, by this. So um, the symphony will be okay. Um, it's kind of the non-endowment folks that you know we're really trying to reach out to and, and partner and collaborate. But in itself as well, you know, just the act in itself, because on a macro level, we talk a lot about collegiate practice and institutions. But when it comes to the program and the practice, it's often siloed. So even the act of just sharing a bit of resource uh, is, is a bit of a step change for me, because even in cultural districts, when it comes to the practice, it's siloed. So I, I think it, that's good in itself. Biela, you're... Bill, you're talking about some interesting things. Do you, do you want to tell us a little bit or, or not? Yeah. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, well, I'm interested in, in, you know, something which many of us may face or have already faced, which is this question of social unrest in urban environment, uh, which can be chronic, but which also can be very spasmodic, uh, leading to major outbursts. And I'm trying to think through uh, working in a city where that has happened on a number of occasions, uh, what uh, a cultural district, which is, in, uh, which is still being planned in our instance, um, but which is located in what, what has been the hotspot for some of those tensions, uh, what a cultural district and the various initiatives that come with that can really do to productively intervene into that. Um, you know, so I don't have answers for it. I'm really looking for, for answers. Um, there has been a major, there was a major um, a problem in 2010 with, uh, with the Tivoli Gardens incursion. <clears throat> Sorry, and there have been, <clears throat> um, sorry, I have a bit of a sinus problem here, <laughs> but there have been some artistic interventions after the fact in that, but I'm also interested what can be done when you see it happening in front of you, when you see it emerging. I mean, what, what sort of interventions can an art district uh, and, and the, the communities that are involved in that uh, really make in, in that context? So, so I'm really trying to, to think it through and it would be good for me to hear what has been done in other uh, contexts where such is, issues arise. Mm. But I think they're uh, also, it, it's it, also right, isn't it? The polarization in, we're talking a lot about the power of communities, but the polarization with unemployment and the things Adrian were talking about are going to come to the fore as well. So big challenges. Gabriella. Uh, so, so that was always a really interesting question for us when working on, on public space projects in, in Mexico City, because Mexico City has never not been volatile and it has not, never not been divisive and divided. Um, so one of the projects that we worked on that was led by the Playful Cities team at the lab, which basically Playful Cities tried to think about how can play be a city making tool and how do we actually add a kid's perspective to urban planning because believe it or not Mexico City has more than uh, almost 5 million kids in a metropolitan area under age 14 so that's kind of like a whole Finland of just children under age 14 
Yeah. And uh, to think about spatial justice, uh, we developed a tool at the lab using GIS where you could cross indexes of segregation and marginalization, uh, concentration of kids block by block, and then cross that with lack of access to public space. And then that would give you hotspots across the city so that the, the government could actually order the way that it rolled out public space, no longer in the places that there was already a huge allocation, but the places that needed it the most. Um, to nobody's surprise, obviously, that led us to some of the roughest, toughest, most dangerous areas of Mexico City. And it became truly fascinating, though not necessarily for the faint-hearted to work with the local communities there while we were rescuing public spaces or creating new typologies to create public space out of nothing because 60% of Mexico City is self-constructed. So sometimes we actually had to come up with ideas of, of how we created, you know, when there's no public space to rescue, how do you create that space? And uh, first of all, one of the insights that we had is, yeah, uh, I absolutely agree, uh, Verli, it cannot be makeup participatory practice. Like people there are very sensitive in anything that even has a whiff, especially being government, that they're every, like, you know, the, the mistrust between government and citizens in Mexico City is huge. It's uh, one of the lowest uh, trust uh, uh, ratios in the world. So as government, even a whiff of something that is makeup or that is only narrative, it, it, it just makes everything boomerang. But so going deep into participatory practices and really knowing that tensions will always exist and not shying away from them was interesting. And also how do you incorporate the shadow life? Uh, because we weren't there necessarily, for example, to deal with the, the street um, drug dealing. Uh, we were there actually to pact with the street dealers to say like we're going to actually create the safe space for children you have kids and he has kids can we actually make a pact and so many policy makers would shy away from this is like no no no. what do you mean like you know how can we allow for this to be happening and it's like this is a reality that will go on notwithstanding the public spaces that we create so you either address it and look at you know the shadowy bit of your society and your city and know how to work with that and then you know the 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 drug conversation happens elsewhere, or you don't necessarily get very far. So it is it is working with tender hooks. But I have, and I, I'd be happy to share the later call just to not take the the conversation off into another realm. But we there was so so many really interesting practices that we found, as well as things that we explored ourselves, and uh, very surprising results of communities really actually creating these social packs, if you will, around spaces that they felt were theirs. Um, and this is going on to the state, even though you know, I, I've been out of government for a year, because if you really commit deeply with, with the citizens, there is a sense of ownership that goes beyond anything that government uh, or institutions actually, uh, you know, just like more of catalyzing and letting that grow a life of its own, but catalyzing in the right way. Medellin's a good example of that, eh, where they've used cultural infrastructures in that way in marginalized neighborhoods in Colombia. Okay, I'm aware, as always, these the time's flown by on this, so we're into the final 10 minutes. I will ask all the speakers to come back. But is it, does anybody got something they would love to tell us or share with us or a question or a point? They're very well behaved. Nobody? Nina, let's talk a bit as we get towards the end about bringing some of these things together. We're still, we've still got some of these contradictions, haven't we, when we're talking about, and also the nature of cultural districts in this context. They are often in city centres, they aren't, you know, we've got just what Gabriella was talking about. How do we connect with wider communities with some of the real social change stuff that you've all been talking about? You got any thoughts on that from wider? It's a big question, but yeah, you know, um, so as probably many people know, in social capital theory, there's this idea of bridging capital and bonding capital. And we bond with people who we know very well and we are very similar to and close to, and we bridge with people who are very different from us. And one of the things that um, 
I really grappled with when I was a museum director trying to create a very bridged space. I found it very helpful finding some research about how particularly with communities, in this case they were focused in the Bay Area of California on immigrant communities who had come to the Bay. Um, but when you're talking about communities who may feel marginalized or unsafe um, or just unwelcome or haven't spent time in a space, they talk about this idea of bonded bridging, that often the um, kind of safest way to start to enter into something like a cultural district or any kind of district that is foreign to you is with your own group, um, and but seeing others. And this idea that it's not that it's just us today, you know, it's <clears throat> Latinx Cultural Festival or it's Youth Day, but that there are kids doing something and there's something else going on over here and you can start to be in contact with each other to do that bonded bridging. And I guess I'm thinking about some of the physical distancing, social distancing rules right now and um, kind of some of our opportunities to think about how we might rebuild some of these districts in a way that invites people to come with their bonded group, whether that's the family who they're distancing with or whether it's their very small group of friends or, or their, you know, their music group, whatever. Um, but then to also see that other things are happening in the space. And I guess I think, you know, and Layla's just put this question about Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park in the chat. I, I think that now is a time for us to be very explicit about describing the communities we most want to prioritize and privilege in our spaces, giving them the best space, the best time, um, but then also thinking about how are we bridging different bonded groups, different communities within our space, so that you do start to have some of that exchange and that sense that we are building something new together in a truly diverse way, as opposed to, oh, this space used to be for these people, and now it's shifted and it's for those people. Now, how do we make it spaces where there is this sense of bridging among different groups? And I actually think that the way distancing will lift and already how things are shifting means it's quite possible that the way people are going to enter public space anyway is within bonded groups, seeing others at distance. So how can you make that something where the others they're seeing are really from different backgrounds, such that you might start to feel some of that familiarity, comfort, and interest in getting to know those people more closely as it becomes safer to do so. And, so and if, I, if I may end there, Sorry, as as um, as a follow up, um, perhaps then the, also the conversation of how we are how we silently code spaces is also of extreme importance because I mean many times I find interesting that new districts or, or public spaces get created and you see pictures and it's people that very much look like each other. So what are these spaces actually doing and how are we coding those spaces silently and how can they actually be uh, more of an open invitation for very diverse to communities to come in and to really appropriate um, that space and, and sometimes actually even seeking out to have a, a, a much more extreme and diverse population actually populating these spaces. No, and, and things that, for example, one of my favorite cultural directors in, in Mexico City that ran um, the Vasconcelos libraries for many, many, many years and unfortunately stepped down a year ago. But uh, he, he, the, the place where this, it's the biggest museum in Mexico, um, one of the biggest in the world actually, but the community wasn't necessarily using it and it was in a, in a somewhat also dangerous-ish space. And first of all, it was really interesting to know that people were coming from all places, uh, from all corners of the city would sometimes travel two hours to actually get there. But then Daniela was also inviting in the homeless population, for example, or the people that were selling uh, potato chips outside of of his library. It turned out that the daughter, they were from an indigenous community because Mexico City has a lot of uh, internal immigration from indigenous communities. It turned out that the daughter, um, their daughter did, couldn't speak and since they were they were illiterate, they never were, they weren't able to communicate with her directly. So he started a whole program for literacy for families around um, around all sorts of different community bonds. So it was not only like come in, but I'm actually gonna create programs around you because the things that you guys are facing, other communities are facing them as well. So yes, how are we coding spaces and how are we really making a true invitation 
for this to be an incredibly plural uh, and diverse community, I think is also important. I think you both make very point very well made. Partnership only really works with ownership and that and uh, programs, but also in employment, in in, in jobs, in, in economy, all of that. I mean, Genevieve, that's sort of the stuff you started off us talking about very much about how partnership and ownership needs to be the DNA of what we do. Yeah, I think, um, you know, districts have an opportunity to do an audit of, of their district to find out which organizations are suffering, which ones need that, that support. Is there an opportunity for some of their staff members to be working alongside, you know, larger institution staff members? How can you create a kind of exciting, extraordinary bubble <laughs> within your districts um, to advance, you know, really innovative, exciting ideas that are relevant to, to your community? I think there's, um, there's great opportunity there. Okay. I, I'll give the last minute to Beatrice, actually, probably who might want to just say a bit about um, uh, GCDN and where they're going for and everything. We're, we're nearly at the end. I just wanted to, I think, you know, I've been in lots of conversations, as we all have the last few weeks, and it is a very difficult situation across the world and people have lost their lives and we know all of that. And it's, it's um, grim and our institutions and places we work are facing a lot of challenges, but we've always been about hope and looking at the world in a different way and fun and all of those sort of things and we have to rediscover that as well as the pragmatic and practical solutions and I feel uplifted by this conversation I think our three contributors or speakers have been really really good in that sense and you know uh, we need a bit of that and we should you know be able to explore our imaginations as well so um, I'll, I'll hand over to Beatrice and she can maybe just uh, some up for, or, or Adrian from from their point of view, but I wanted to thank particularly Gabriella and Nina and Genevieve and, and thank all of you for coming along and I hope you found it um, um, useful. So Beatrice, thank you, Beatrice. Um, so thank you very much all of you for joining and particularly to the contributors. I think we've um, asked some really important questions that I know many of our members are considering at the moment um, and pointed to some emerging um, possibilities and new ways of doing things. Um, at GCDN we will continue to try and weave these new stories and trends together um, and are building up to our next series of um, GCDN conversations which will focus on the future of cultural districts. So now that we are beginning to perhaps re-emerge from the coronavirus crisis, um, what possibilities are there to do things differently um, and what will cultural districts look like in the future. Um, and a lot of today's discussion has been really rich um, for that next um, conversation, so thank you. Um, I'd really like to dig into that further and I think some of the suggestions about, you know, almost mapping and listening to your communities and um, understanding uh, what they need is obviously there but also looking at the more at the sort of structural side of things the financing um, the legalities um, sort of systemic um, structures that are needed to make these more equitable um, the, the staffing um, these are all fundamental questions that many of us in the cultural sector and beyond are looking at um, so please join us for the next um, round. It will be in the next few weeks, probably in three or four weeks. Um, and I hope uh, you all enjoyed it. Huge thanks to our speakers. A huge thanks to Donald for chairing and leading us through. Um, and see you next time. Thank you. Well Bye-bye.